Greetings, everyone. I've got something a little different for you today. I've been working on this Zenith uh, chassis. It's a G725 chassis. I was going to do a complete restore on it, recap it, and replace the resistors that have gone out of tolerance. And something unusual cropped up. While I was uh, just listening to it and playing around with it, I found that the volume kept dropping out on it. It would just totally go away. And uh, it turns out that uh, there's something uh, going on inside the volume control here. And I think it's a little bit different than usual because it's not so much when you turn it that the, it gets scratchy like most of them usually do. Uh, but the volume totally drops out if you push on the shaft a little bit and sometimes even pull on it a little bit, it'll just totally drop out. And so I did the usual uh, attempts to repair it using the, the old Deoxid D5, and the uh, when that didn't work, I went to the F5 uh, fader controls, and that, that didn't help any either. So I got a feeling that uh, the wiper inside here has uh, uh, lost its tension and contact with the uh, carbon resistive element. And uh, I talked to a buddy of mine about it, and he said to me, uh, he said, why don't you just do a video on it when you tear it apart so we can all enjoy your failure on this. So <laughs> I don't know. I hope it's not going to be a failure. I hope I can get in there and uh, get it apart. This radio is over 70 years old, and I think uh, a lot of the parts on it are uh, repairable. So why don't we get started tearing this apart and we'll do a quick little video about it and uh, maybe it'll help someone else out that's doing this project that has a similar situation. A set of tools here. I think all we'll need, hopefully, is uh, long nose pliers, a thin bladed screwdriver, and this little jewel that I picked up many, many years ago and it's it's become invaluable. It's like a mini channel lock pliers, and uh, uh, it really helps when you're working on little stuff like this. So uh, we'll get started here and uh, see what we can come up with. Now this has a little locking tab on it that might cause us a little bit of grief here. It has a, a tab right in here that I think we can, once you get that little tab untwisted there, we can probably pry it up a little bit. That's the only thing unusual about this potentiometer is this thing here, so we'll just Pull him off of there. Put a set him aside in the magnetic holder. And uh, should be the only thing we need to do is uh, pry these tabs out. And the back should slide off of this all right. If I can do this without injuring myself. There we go. Many channel locks comes to the rescue again. I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. If I push it any harder, the whole thing will blow. Great little tool if you can find one. I have no idea where you get it. Well, I must be getting old because I've done this a hundred times before and I don't know why I didn't remember this, but there's a much better technique of getting these tabs all open and that's just to use your wire cutters. Just uh, wedge it under there, give it a little squeeze and a twist and they come off so easy. It's just incredible. I, I don't know why I didn't remember that. So just a little sidebar here. Okay, we'll set that aside and we'll see if we can carefully pull this apart. This is the switch, of course, and it 
goes back there. And this is the wiper connection. I was gonna see what the tension was on this. It's pretty loose. What I would like to do is uh, pull this shaft out from here, but it has this little locking ring on here that we'll have to remove without losing it. And I'm not sure how to go about doing that easily. I'll have to get in there with something and pry those apart. I don't have a snap ring tool that's that small to get in there. So I have to get out a bunch of little tiny screwdrivers and try that. Well, I ended up getting out my drill press vise just to clamp this shaft in there so I can get in here and pry on it a little, a little better. Well, that works a little, that works pretty good. It's coming apart, I don't know if you can see that, but. Just put two screwdrivers in there and pry apart a little bit. That's a little better, a little wider now. Maybe I can get a locker and pliers in there. As soon as I find it, I'll be right back. Well, I found my snap ring pliers, but it's still too big to get in there. So I think what I'll do, I'll just pry this thing open. And uh, we'll worry about getting it in there properly when we get done with it. It's not really a uh, spring steel ring. It's just a... piece of steel wire. I know you're all probably waiting for me to jab myself in the hand. Try not to do that. There we go. That's what we wanted. I guess it can stay on there now. So we'll take this out of the clamp and take a look here. Okay, now here's what we're dealing with. Looks quite dirty. But now that we got this out, we can uh, gently pry up on, on these a little bit, but uh, I'm gonna clean this up somewhat first. Well, you can see, see if you can see that or not, but that has seen a lot of use. It is worn flat. But I think we can salvage it. Let me get a paper towel here and some cleaner. And a few Q-tips. Got some 91% alcohol we'll just use on it. And Clean it up. I'm sure regular rubbing alcohol, 71% would do fine too. Actually probably be a, even a little easier on the carbon strip here.
This is a 2.2 mega ohm pot, in case you're wondering. And I think I'm just going to flush this out good with some contact cleaner. And we can reapply some grease. I have some old silicone uh, clutch grease. I have an old IBM key punch machine I might use on that shaft. That'll make it nice and smooth when you turn it. Now that that's fairly well clean, I think I've got a little burnishing tool here that these are real handy for doing things like this too. It's a diamond burnishing tool. It's very fine and uh, it's uh, great for removing oxide and stuff you don't want on delicate contacts without removing too much of the contact itself. So you don't want to use sandpaper on this or anything like that. That would be a big no-no. This is so fine that it's almost like uh, paper. Not sandpaper, but just regular paper. What you could do in a pinch, you could use that in a pinch, that would work good. Yeah, that's looking pretty shiny. And what I think we'll do now is uh, we can get in close on this. I'm going to slightly bend these out a little bit so they'll put a little more pressure on the carbon track. I think that's what the problem was. These have just lost their tension over 70 years. And, uh, give me a magnifier here and see if I can see. I want to make these even. So they'll have the same pressure. These also want to form out a little bit. It's what they call it. Technicians don't call it bending anymore. They call it forming. So we'll form these up a little. And you can see that. That looks pretty good. And I want to burnish this just a little bit. Once we get it partially back together, I'll put it on the meter again and make sure it's making good contact before I get it all put back together and won't have to take it apart again. The other point of failure, I suppose, would be right here where the uh, center tab connects to this ring. I think what we'll do is, hopefully you can see this, I'm going to turn this meter on, the ohm scale, and make sure we have a good connection here.
between the center conductor or the wiper assembly. I don't know if you can see that or not. That's a little better. Get it out of the reflection there. Point two ohms, which is just about the value of my meter leads. Okay, well, I think we have a pretty good connection there. All right. Set him aside and go back to uh, lubricating and uh, reassembling this thing. I think what I want to put on it is some D5. I'm sorry, F5. It's a, I have a little bottle of it here. It's, it's for faders and it has a little more lubricant in it than the D5. So it slides a little better. A little more lubricant and a little more uh, viscosity to it. And it's supposed to be really good for faders. You know, the slide type faders. This is a rotary type, but uh, same principle. Looks like we've got a lot of rosin on that thing. I should have took that off. Chip that away. There we go. Get rid of this old rosin and Should have done that a little earlier, so I think we'll clean this up again, reapply it. Okay, that's there. Should go back just like that, and the uh, stops on the uh, here will keep it from going too far. While well, I'm at it, I'm going to give a little shot of contact cleaner inside the switch. Okay, now, if I can remember which way this goes in, I think it should go in this way. Since that tab would interfere with the uh, insulation here. Well, there are two ways the blade of this shaft could actually go into the switch, and one of them wouldn't allow you to completely rotate the uh, arm on this thing. So I found the right one, and now it uh, rotates all the way, makes a nice click when you turn it off, and so I'll do that. And uh, while I go clean this up, and find my lubricant. I'm just going to clamp this together with a crescent wrench, keep it from flying apart. Okay, I've got my uh, cleaner out here. I'm going to uh, spray a little in there and uh, 
clean the inside of this thing off a little bit. Move this over somewhat. There we go. And uh, make it nice and clean. And as that dries, I've got this silicone grease I haven't used for years. It's, it's very, very heavy stuff. It's uh, it's used in clutches, old time clutches for key punch machines. I'm just going to put a little bit around the end of the shaft here. But this stuff is 40 years old if it's a day. But yeah, that make it feel more like a modern day pot. Okay. I can just remember how I did this. I think we're about ready to put the uh, snap ring back on there. So, clamp that on so it don't fly apart. about reforming this ring a little bit so it'll go on there tighter. It's probably a little too tight. This is a first for me too, folks, so you'll have to bear with me on this. I'll just have to cut the video down if it gets too painfully long. I'm gonna spread those a little bit. Well, we're part way there. I'm sure there's a tool to do this somewhere. But anyway. I think it's back in the groove now. Squeeze them back together. There we go. That was a nice reassuring snap. See where that slot is in there? This has got to be in there just the right way so these stops will work properly. There we go. Had it 180 degrees out of phase there. All right, well, we got that clamped together. I'm going to 
bend a couple of these tabs down just to make it good and tight and we'll test this thing, see how it works. Okay, didn't want to bend him too much, but Okay, let's take a look at it on the meter and see how smooth it is. Okay, we're back on the meter now and I'm just got the uh, pot hooked up to the leads and I'm just going to give it a small rotation here from one end to the other, you can see that it has a uh, audio taper on it just by how fast it moves on this meter. And I think, I think we have success here. Another beautiful thing about analog meters is you can tell the taper of a pot real easy on these. So, all right, we'll uh, call this a success. We'll get the pot back in the uh, radio and uh, see how it sounds under actual combat conditions. And now through a little bit of movie magic, we've got the potentiometer all soldered back in. And uh, we're going to go over here to the psycho signal generator and turn him on. And we're going to uh, put in a, probably an AM amplitude modulated signal to the radio and uh, listen to it that way and test out this uh, new volume control. That way when we, uh, if there's any problems with it, it'll show up a lot better under a uh, 400 hertz sine wave or 800 hertz, whatever this thing puts out. Looks like it's 400. And uh, that way we can see it and hear it a little better than if we just got a Little scratchy voice recording on a AM radio station or FM radio station, something like that. But this radio is an AM FM, but uh, we're going to put it on AM here. And uh, let's get her flipped over and all hooked up, and we'll give it a final test. All right, now we've got the radio in the operating position, and we've got it plugged into the uh, uh, Isolation transformer and the variac. We've got the signal generator turned on and the lights turned down low so we can see the soft glow of the tubes. And let's, uh, we also have the oscilloscope turned on if we want to look at the signal on that. But uh, uh, put the knobs on it so we can, uh, let's give this thing a, a little quick turn on here. And this has a unique uh, power light on it, it's neon. And it's not the regular 47 uh, lamp that most radios have in it, but... Uh, okay, she's all warmed up. Sounds like we got a little background noise there. Uh, let's see if we can find where this... Oh, there's the signal from the signal generator. See it over here on the oscilloscope a little better. Let's turn the volume up somewhat. It's probably not the cleanest signal because we're bringing in some AM also, and it also could use a good alignment too. But uh, let's try out this volume control here and, and uh, let's see. Oh, this sounds pretty nice. It is silky smooth, I'll tell you that. 
Now for the acid test, we're going to give a push on it and a good pull. A little bit of volume change there. But uh, as a whole, interference on the AM band but uh, I'm very pleased with the way that turned out so I guess uh, you guys if you have a old radio that uh, you think the volume control shot on it well uh, tear it apart and uh, watch the video and see if you can't uh, salvage it I might save you a little money and uh, a whole radio if you can't get a hold of the proper volume control for it. So, anyway, uh, that's it for this project. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we sure do appreciate your support and uh, signing up. We will see you the next time I have something unusual to show you. Bye for now.